Good afternoon. Today is November 30th, 1998. We're here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. And in continuing our Veterans Oral History Project, this afternoon we're interviewing Mr. Francis, better known as Frank mm -hmm. Foley. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Mr. Foley. Good afternoon. How are you? Yeah, I'm well, Joan, and you? I'm just fine. Good. Um, can you tell me your current address? In Greenfield, Massachusetts. Which is yeah. in the western part of Massachusetts? Right, just 40 miles north of Springfield. Okay, mm -hmm. and you, your current marital status? I'm divorced. And yes. you do have children, I understand. Yes, I have seven. Yeah. And, and yeah. grandchildren? I have 12 of them. <laughs> and may I ask you your age? Sure, I'm 76. Yeah. And where were you born? I was born in Worcester. And were you raised and, in Worcester? No, we were there for probably uh, three to four years. And then my father's work took him to Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, the depression uh, ensued and, uh, and, and bad health uh, on the part of both my parents uh, and we found ourselves back in Natick uh, or moving to Natick in 1933. <coughs> what did your father do for a living? He was a leather tanner and, uh, <coughs> and uh, quite good at his craft from what some of our, my relatives have told me anyway. But, uh, so when you moved back to Natick, was, was he in ill health then? Yes, and we, um, as a matter of fact, it was a breakup of the family, really. <clears throat> and, uh, and I saw him really only once um, from, uh, from that time until the time that I had heard that he had died. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and did your mother bring you back to Natick? Our, our mother did, and, uh, and her health wasn't all that great either. Uh, and we came to live with uh, an aunt and an uncle here in Natick. In, and what street was uh, that? That was on Bacon Street. What was Natick like in 1933? Do you remember? Oh God, yes. It was. <laughs> it was. It was a small town, um, and uh, probably 10 to 12,000 people. Very comfortable living. Uh, we had. Uh, uh, we we had we had a lot of open land up on we lived up on Bacon Street as I mentioned up n fairly near the Bacon School, uh, which is now an, an open space. It's a it's a playground now. Right. Did, and, what was and the, your aunt and uncle's name? Mr. and Mrs. James C. Fair, and uh, they had no children of their own, and Mrs. Fair was uh, my mother's sister, mm -hmm. and uh, and they took. They took us in. They took in my three sisters and myself, and uh, and raised us uh, really as their own. Uh, I was uh, ten at the time, ten or eleven, going on eleven, I guess. And I had an older sister, and then one younger who still lives in Natick, and she's married to uh, Donald McIva, who uh, runs McIva Bish Travel, and uh, and and. Uh, my oldest sister has died, and the sister who was next to me has also died. So you and grew up grew up on Bacon Street. Did you go to the Bacon Street School? I went to the Bacon School in the sixth grade, and uh, and then down to the Coolidge Junior High. And did and, you walk uh, to school? Oh sure. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Except in really bad days, and then my uh, my aunt would get the family car out of the garage and. And drive a gang of us down to uh, to the to the Coolidge Junior High, sure. But most of the time we walked. Yeah. And what what types of uh, after school or weekend activities do you remember doing? It was um, it was mostly uh, athletics. Uh, uh, say, in weather like this, we certainly would be playing football, and then a little later on we would be uh, going skating over in the home school pond. As they called it, across from the uh, from the Walnut Hill School, they used to flood that meadow, and uh, and and it would have, it made a wonderful place to skate. I believe and there are houses there. There now. are houses indeed there now, yes. all all through there, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> and um, and a lot of a lot of Saturdays, uh, in in this kind of weather, going on toward the winter. Uh, my aunt and uncle, and quite frequently just my uncle, 
would take uh, a whole gang of us, uh, neighbors' children, uh, and uh, and ourselves, and we would go into places like the uh, Peabody Museum and at Harvard, uh, and uh, and go to different events. And we had some next door neighbors who did the same thing. There was a fellow who was the treasurer of the uh, Natick Vice and Savings Bank. His name was Royal Tyler, and he was a great outdoorsman. and uh, And he would take some of us uh, boys mostly. Uh, and, uh, and we would be, go into the sportsman show. Uh, we'd sometimes go to baseball games or uh, things of that nature. It was, uh, it, was a, it was a great time. We also did an awful lot of gardening. Uh, the, those houses up there, and they still have big lawns. And, uh, and at the time my aunt and uncle retired, they had to fill in all the gardens. But, uh, but we did a, an awful lot of weeding <laughs> and, uh, you know, and edging of the gardens and stuff like that. It was great work. I, uh, thoroughly enjoyable. I, uh, so in spite I, of the fact that your family was sort of broken up because of your parents' illnesses, mm -hmm. you yeah. had a good life growing Oh, up. yeah, we did. We had, yeah, we were very fortunate because at the time, of course, it was in the 30s, uh, and uh, you know we never we never did not have enough food nor warm clothing, and that couldn't be said for everybody back then. And in, in, what in did the 30s. your uncle, Mr. Fair, do? Mr. Fair was uh, my uncle was a uh, an executive with New England Telephone, and uh, had a, an extremely responsible job, and uh, did it very well, really. And did you graduate from Natick High School in 1940? Yeah. What was Natick High like then? Small, uh, full of spirit, uh, great, great. I, I just, I really, my sophomore year and my senior year, I think, were the two, two of the best years of my life. <laughs> Why do you say that? <clears throat> I was in, involved in an awful lot of activities. The student government, I played football, had a lot of friends, and just, just it, and, uh, didn't act in in any of the plays, but was uh, you know was on the property committee or whatever, and uh, and then uh, you know the dances that we used to go to, it uh, it was it was a wonderful time, wonderful time to grow up. That's great. So you graduated in 1940, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. what? Did you go out to school or out to work? Uh, no, I went. Uh, I uh, oh, when you speak of work, uh, I I had I had quite a few. Uh, lawns that I cut during, uh, you know, during the time that I was in high school, uh, and they were, uh, they were all, you know, they were all pretty substantial, and, uh, and I got, uh, I think I got the lordly sum of about 35 cents an hour, and it was not, it was not with a power mower. I don't think they had been invented yet, but it was all, you know, the push, the push mower, the, the hand mower. And, uh, but it didn't do me any harm, really. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, when I graduated from high school, I was fortunate enough to get a, uh, an athletic scholarship to um, Georgetown University um, for football. And uh, I, um, I don't, as I look back on that experience now, it was wonderful, and I, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. But I, uh, I developed a, a real bad case of stomach trouble down there. And I think it was really from, whether it was insecurity, if you want to call it that, or worry or whatever, that I was, that I was going to fail. And uh, so at the end of my freshman year, I had to leave there because I was on a special diet and, uh, uh, and under, medical, under medical attention uh, for what was later diagnosed as ulcers. And, uh, and I was 18, 19 at the time, and, uh, but uh, then I was, I was treated at, uh, at the Leahy Clinic and, and Deaconess Hospital, and the treatment was totally different then. I, it was bed rest and all that sort of stuff, so, uh, so I, uh, but I, it, it eventually cleared up and to the point where I was admitted into the Army. Yeah. Well, and yeah. so after you left Georgetown mm -hmm. and you had <clears throat> a bit of illness, yeah. did you and go to work prior to? No, no? no I, I went to uh, Boston University mm -hmm. and uh, 
then I continued uh, to hold part-time jobs uh, like the, the old First National, which is which was downtown, um, and uh, later on uh, I was a night custodian down at the art building down at Wellesley College, uh, in, that was in 1942, and, uh, and I worked at the Denison Manufacturing. In Framingham? Summer, yeah, mm -hmm, summers, yeah. And then yeah. when did you enter the military? In December of uh, 1942. And were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted. I couldn't, I, couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't get in because of my eyesight. I couldn't pass the physical uh, for my eye, because of my eyesight. And my eyesight was, was fairly, it, it wasn't as good then as it is now. Really, it seems to have improved considerably. Uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't pass any of the tests to get into, say, a Navy program or, or uh, ROTC or anything of that nature. So I had to wait to be drafted. And, uh, and were yeah. you drafted into the Army? Drafted into the Army, yeah. And so here you were with bad eyesight and yeah. <laughs> ulcers, and yet you still got in, huh? But, but by that time, the ulcers had uh, been pretty well cured. Um, I wasn't... Uh, I'd, I had not had any alcohol at that particular time. I didn't drink at all. Uh, I smoked occasionally, uh, and I didn't drink coffee. So I drank an awful lot of milk and I ate an awful lot of ice cream. <laughs> but uh, so uh, my stomach uh, bothered me sometime after I got out of the army, but that was due to uh, other causes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Mm -hmm. But, so you mm -hmm. were approximately what, nineteen or twenty years old? I was twenty. Were... I was twenty years old when I went into the uh, service. Mm -hmm. And where did you go? Went to uh, well, we were inducted at um, at uh, Fort Devens, and from there, uh, I went to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, um, and I was there for approximately eight months um, in the uh, in the artillery. Uh, excuse me. Uh, whoop, little hot dog. That's Casey's hot dog. <laughs> yeah, I understand, yeah. right? <laughs> um, and uh, then we, um, they had the the army had a program. They called it the Army Specialized Training Program, uh, and it was set up. Uh, the The basic idea was that those in the language sections. Uh, would uh, would participate in invasions uh, and drop with uh, reconnaissance teams and, and parachute teams and so on and uh, act as interpreters for for groups or squads or companies or whatever um, and th but that that didn't that unfortunately didn't materialize um, we went uh, uh, we were selected because of our uh, are having had prior college uh, studies and, and disciplines and so on, uh, and we were given an op we were sent to I should say various colleges throughout the country. I happened to end up at Syracuse University in uh, in a French section. Uh, I had had French in high school and college, and it was intensive. Uh, we had instructors who spoke nothing but French to us in class. And How many were the, in your class? There were, in my, in my section there were probably 25, 25 soldiers. And, uh, and they had a German section, a Russian section, uh, and a Spanish section. And, uh, and all of the, but they were broken up into several different 25 soldier uh, sections of each of those languages. And, uh, and we studied the history uh, and the geography and the language itself. And, and were you in the French I section? Was in, I was in the French section, mm -hmm. right. Was and, it all day, every weekday? It, it was five days. I mean, we went to classes, uh, yeah, and we had physical training, you know, and uh, we did not, uh, as I recall now, we did not have any uh, close order drill or any military stuff, although we had to maintain our uniforms uh, and we had to uh, act in a military manner, 
Uh, we didn't have any training as such uh, that you would see certainly on a post like Fort Jackson or someplace like that. It so at Fort school. Jackson mm -hmm. you had your basic training mm -hmm. that lasted how many weeks? That, that lasted about 12 weeks and then and then um, uh, further artillery training uh, <clears throat> and then and then I went to uh, and then I went to Syracuse University. And how <clears throat> long were you at Syracuse? We I was there from September of um, 1943 until March of 1944 when they folded the whole program. They just they just folded the whole program. And I I I, I have a sneaking suspicion that what happened was that the uh, the uh, the government decided that they, they needed to reinforce some of the universities who were losing students and they needed to infuse some money in there, so they sent us for training. Uh, that I, It's maybe a wild cockamamia story, I don't know, but I mean uh, all, of the, all of the grand plans that we had had laid out before us all kind of went for naught, uh, you know, like dropping in with paratroopers and you know, and recon teams and whatnot. Uh, n not much of that happened, as far as I know, really. So once they dropped the program, what happened with you and your group? Okay, um, we were split up, and some went to, you know, all different posts throughout uh, throughout the states, and I happened to go to uh, the 69th Division down in Camp Shelby, Mississippi. What was that like? Oh, that was hot, <laughs> but but it's uh, uh, it was okay. I I, uh, uh, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, when I when I first went down there, uh, there was um, there wasn't a great deal of uh, camaraderie uh, because uh, you're moving into a new you know moving into existing cliques as it were, uh, and uh, and and some people you know they they weren't overly friendly, let me put it that way. Up until yeah. that time, yeah. had you been able to make any friendships th through either yeah. the basic training or through Syracuse? M mostly through Syracuse, mm -hmm. right. Um, at Fort Jackson, uh, I was friendly with, uh, with many of the people that I was with, and we were, uh, the unit that I was in in the artillery was the survey outfit, and we were a close-knit small group. Uh, but I, uh, I, I, I don't remember, you know, writing to any of these fellows afterwards or, or anything else really. Uh, but we were we were close knit while we were together. Uh, and then at, at at Camp Shelby, as I say, we moved into these already existing groups. Um, and what happened was that uh, a lot of them, a lot of them had been training for a good period of time and they were moved out prior to D-Day and those of us who had not had a great deal of training uh, were, were left there and we brought in new recruits uh, and that's when uh, we developed, began to develop uh, much, uh, a much closer knit unit because it was more like our own and it wasn't, you know, that we were moving in on, on an established uh, unit. So, how long were you at Camp Shelby before you were moved out? Yeah, we were there from March of, 90, of 1944 until November of 1944. And in November, were you? The term yeah. being shipped out. We were, yep, yeah, we were, we were shipped out overseas to England. Did you know what was happening? Did you hear about D-Day and all of those? Oh things? yes, we we heard about that. We were, as a matter of fact, we were out in the field um, on the sixth of June, and uh, and we heard all about it through you know radio and reports and all that sort of stuff, and uh, so we knew that at, at some point, you know, that certainly we were going to get involved in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you arrived by ship. Do you remember what ship you were yeah, on? Yeah, on the SS John Erickson. Yeah. Out of what uh, city? Out of, out, of, out of New York. 
Prior to leaving, were you able to get home to Natick at all? No, but uh, my aunt and my older sister came down to meet me in, in New York. And, and, uh, our, but we, we, got, we got like a 36-hour, 48-hour pass or something of that nature, and, and, and a couple of uh, my buddies and, and I, a fellow from Dorchester, as a matter of fact, who was our squad leader. He and I and, and two other fellows got a hotel room in some place in New York. I've forgotten where it was now. But uh, they came down, they took a train down, and Matt and we were, we were there. Uh, we had pretty much all of one day together. You know. Do you remember yeah. what it was like to say goodbye to your aunt and your sister? Mm. Was mm. it hard? Yeah. Was it hard for them? <clears throat> it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you each yeah. able to verbalize your concerns, or did you sort of keep it all in? I just kind of kept it all in, I think, yeah. My, uh, my sister, the oldest sister, the one who has since died, uh, and you may remember Mary Foley. Do you remember Mary Foley? Yeah. I remember the name. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, Mary. Um, she was um, she, she was kind of shaken up about it. Yeah, and uh, and and my aunt was kind of uh, reserved in any event. But uh, I remember she gave me a hug, you know, and told me to be careful. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, yeah. So then you went on the SS John Erickson. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to get over to? You said England. Yeah, we would. Uh, I think it took us about ten days mm -hmm. uh, because of the threat of the. There was still the threat of the submarines, but it had been diminished certainly uh, considerably by that time, and uh, and uh, it uh, the trip over was not all that bad, although. Uh, there were 5,000 troops on that ship, and uh, two days out of New York, we got a slight ground swell. And I, <laughs> I, I think, and one other fellow in our, my squad were the first <laughs> ones to get seasick. God, it was awful. <laughs> was that your first <laughs> oh, time yeah. on a ship? Oh, that was my yeah. first time on anything that big, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was, oh, oh, it was awful, really, mm -hmm. yeah. But, uh, and once yeah. you arrived in England, did mm -hmm. you, was it London or? We got into Southampton mm -hmm. and, and then we were brought up country uh, uh, for additional training and, uh, you know, and getting new equipment and getting up to a staging area and so on. We spent Christmas there uh, and uh, it was, you know, it, it, of course it was blackout, it was wartime, you know. And the, and the poor English people didn't have much at all, you know, what they had been, what they had been through. And they had been through quite a lot Absolutely. with the war. Yeah. Do you remember mm -hmm. the effect it might have had on you seeing the remnants of the war? Well, I, we were out in the country and I, and I never got a pass uh, to get into London uh, or any of the other places that had been severely damaged. But, um, but so, uh, just in talking with some of the people who had seen it, it was, they said that it was, you know, it was, uh, the devastation was, uh, was terrific, really, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I did not see that, no. I was to see it later on in Germany, though, yeah. So once yeah. you left uh, Southampton, you said you went further? Yeah. We went inland, inland more, okay. yeah, into, what had what, what was an already established staging area set up by prior uh, U.S. troops, and uh, they were in the, we were in the Quonset huts, and uh, and it was uh, additional training, more training. Would this uh, be more, infantry training? Yeah, combat well, tra training. <coughs> combat training, uh, <clears throat> and more familiarization with the anti-tank gun uh, that we had. Uh, additional training with that. Uh, some of the firing of it, uh, just everything to do with getting ready to get over to do what we had to do. And how long were you in that area before you moved out again? We moved, uh, then we moved across, we were there for probably four weeks. I think it was right after Christmas that we moved to France. And how did you and get across to France? We went across in uh, in, a, in a barge or whatever, and that and that wasn't bad for that time of year. Uh, we I did not get seasick, uh, so it was fairly calm. And then uh, we uh, we landed uh, 
in northern France, and I'm not sure exactly where, uh, and we boarded a train uh, for going up into, uh, into Belgium. Uh, and, uh, and those events are now somewhat a, a, a little fuzzy, I, uh, you know, places and, and time and whatnot. The only thing that I remember distinctly was uh, uh, when, I, because I could speak French, I was put up. I had a, an assigned duty up in the in the locomotive for for a good part of this trip, because at that time uh, there were still some French uh, people who were sympathetic to the German cause. And the, and the Americans had experienced, um, and, and the English too, I guess, had experienced French engineers uh, opening up the throttle on the downgrade of a train, a troop train or a supply train, and jumping out and letting the damn thing crash. You know? so, so they wanted somebody up there <clears throat> who spoke French, who knew you know, how to talk to these people, and, uh, and then we had to report back to the train commander why we were stopping. And fortunately, I got, uh, I got a couple of real good guys, an engineer and a fireman. And this was all, I, no, I don't, think that it was, I don't think that it was done with wood. I think he, shoveled, he was shoveling coal into this boiler. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and the engineer was a pretty decent fellow, but he knew Every, he knew every in between where we started and where we finished. And he, he would come back, he would stop, uh, and he would come back with a loaf of bread, uh, some wine, and some cheese. <laughs> Did he share it, was, it with you? Oh, God, yes. It was, it was a wonderful trip. <laughs> and I had to, in the meantime, when we stopped, I had to dash a couple of car links up and tell the, tell the commander, uh, the train commander, why, why we were stopping and whatnot. And I, I made up so many lies, <laughs> I don't remember. Well, he had to stop because he had to go to the bathroom. We had to stop to take on water, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it was an interesting train ride. It pro I'm not sure what the distance we covered was, but it took us about 10 hours to, uh, to negotiate it. Yeah. Now, yeah. in, in the, with the fact that you could speak French, were you able to converse at all with some of the villagers also that you yeah, would meet up with? Mainly, uh, oh yes, oh sure, yeah. Uh, but mainly, I, uh, I was um, used to, uh, with, with, uh, with some of the battalion people, uh, and we would go and negotiate with, uh, with somebody for additional billets, you know, for our people. Uh, say for, in, in some cases, maybe even some food or eggs or, or something of that nature. But, uh, but it wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't full time, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, so once you got off of this 10 hour train trip <clears throat> and you went into Belgium, then <clears throat> did you start with your group, did you start walking or were you on trucks? No, we, we, we we had a uh, we had a ton and a half pickup truck, um, and we pulled a uh, we pulled an anti tank gun, so that we rode we we rode across Europe, uh, for which I'm very grateful. Really, yeah. So uh, were you? Yeah. Did you know that when you were going into Belgium that you would eventually end up in Germany? Oh sure. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah yeah. We were um, we were committed um, into battle. Uh, about the second, third, fourth, somewhere around there of February in 1945, uh, and it was one of the we our 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 regiment um, retook one of the one of the first towns uh, that had been taken by the Germans in the Battle of the Bulge, which began in. December, around Christmas time in December of 1944. Do you remember the, what town that was? I, it was Oberreiferscheid, but I, I have no idea how to spell it. At least that's the history that we got, that this was one of the towns that, uh, that, that was taken first by the Germans. Once you 
reclaimed it. Do you remember seeing any of the people from the village or their reactions? No, they or? were. They had. Uh, they had pretty much moved out because there was a very, very heavy um, artillery bombardment by both sides, uh, by both the uh, by the Germans and and ourselves, and so that there was. There wasn't much. There wasn't really much left standing, really. Uh, was it an area that you you could see beauty that had been devastated, or mm. was it city? Was it more country? It, it was really country. It was very rural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very rural, um, and it was a gray, overcast day like this. And we went we went in at night, and uh, and I don't. Uh, uh, all I can remember is the the shells coming in, and you know, and ducking for cover and So whatnot. was this your real mm -hmm. first venture with mm -hmm. combat? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you remember yeah. what it was like for you and for your your troop? Was there fear? Oh, oh, I I think yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I think uh, yeah, I think everybody was pretty scared, you know, really. It's the first time that you're facing live ammo, you know. And, How far uh, away do you think the German enemy was? We were mostly being hit with artillery, so I imagine that they were a good, uh, two, say, two to three miles away anyway, okay? We were to encounter them much more closely later on, yeah. How uh, much later on? Uh, toward, the, uh, toward the end of the war uh, in April, uh, as we moved toward the Elbe River. Uh, and uh, and and we we were pinned down on uh, the day that Roosevelt died. As a matter of fact, we were pinned down in an open field uh, for a good forty-five minutes or an hour, I guess probably, until until the uh, the air force came in and and uh, obliterated the, uh, the the German uh, eighty-eight guns. They they had them on either half tracks or. Or in on tanks or whatever, but they. Uh, Can you explain they, what a half track is? Oh yeah, it's um, it it's uh, got wheels uh, in the front and then tracks on the back, uh, and the gun is mounted on the on the half track. <coughs> and, uh, so you're pinned down with your troops. Approximately how many of you? Ooh, our whole company. Our whole company was there. Uh, which was probably uh, 120, 125 men, uh, and uh, was there a uh, lot of injury or death? No, I no, I don't, I don't recall any, I don't recall anybody getting hurt in in that particular instance. No, uh, but going back to Oberreifferscheid, uh, some people were hurt uh, considerably. You know, this is in February, some people were hurt. And a real good, uh, uh, one of the real good officers that was in a line company, not my company, but a, li a line company, was uh, got a, got shot, got hurt, and shot in the leg, and uh, and because uh, he couldn't get to a, a, an ambulance, a, a station, a medical station, soon enough, they had to amputate his leg. Really, yeah, I, I recall that uh, and feeling very bad. Feeling really terrible about that. He was a wonderful man, really. Were there times, yeah. and specifically, like when you were pinned down for almost an hour, that you or others in your unit were feeling panicky or oh, oh yeah. obviously yeah. frightened? Mm -hmm. Do you re recall uh, what it was like for you? Just uh, no. I guess, yeah, I guess <laughs> you would pray that you'd you'd get out of it, really, you know, and. Uh, Hoping that something would happen, and uh, and uh, obviously we had the superiority because of our air force and and resources and so on, and uh, and b we we could not stand up. We could, you know, we, we had to dig a foxhole. Uh, we could not stand up because if you stood up, you were going to get picked off. And this no. is mid to late winter. Was it cold? Yeah. Was it rainy? Was it snowing? Well, in in um, in April, when we were pinned down in April, it was a nice warm day. It was really nice. But going back to uh, Oberreifferscheid and some times after that, it was uh, it was pretty raw. 
Was it muddy or do you remember were, yeah. anything about the weather? Um, mm, I don't remember, no, I don't remember uh, being stuck in, you know, in the mud and, and whatnot. Uh, as again, you know, our, we, we were, we were riding and, uh, and it was uh, a lot better than, than hoofing it really. Mm -hmm. uh, there was another, uh, there was another time when we were uh, in the, in the Siegfried line uh, and that was probably toward the uh, ooh, maybe early part of March in 1945, and um, and the uh, and there were um, there were how shall I express it? There were a ring. There was a ring of of our anti tank guns protecting uh, a particular area. And out in front of us were the troops, uh, our own troops, dug in, and uh, and the Germans must have spotted uh, a kitchen uh, or something with some smoke, or maybe they spotted some light or whatever, because they started uh, hammering away at us with their artillery, and uh, we were in bunkers, uh, so that uh, so that you know, obviously, if you're sleeping, you you're not going to get hit, but. Uh, but they, uh, they did, they, at that time, I know that they inflicted some hurt. And, um, and then during the day, I remember, they had, they had a very crack gun crew, an anti-tank gun crew from another unit. And, and they, uh, they wheeled their gun out from cover uh, and they were able, they spotted where the fire was coming from and they got off about four or five rounds in real great shape and knocked out. I, th I guess maybe it was either a machine gun or an artillery or something, but they were able to... Uh, they, meaning uh, the Germans, were able to knock no, out no, or the other did. way around? Yeah, I'm we sorry. Did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they, and, and silence the, uh, you know, silence whatever it was that was causing the, uh, the problems. Yeah. When that, uh, something like that would occur, would there be jubilation? Oh, yeah. Could you be noisy, or did you have to keep it under control? Well, you kind of had to keep it under control. You couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't celebrate like you'd like to. But so, yeah. so tell us about a typical day. Mm. It was pretty boring, really. Yeah, yeah. You know, you'd get up in the morning. Uh, uh, you you would have been on guard duty at least once during the night, uh, and. Uh, uh, you you know, probably have something to eat. Maybe try and s sneak a cigarette somewhere. Maybe have a cup of coffee or something to keep you warm, and uh, you know, and uh, and just look. That's all. You just have to be on the lookout for uh, for what was going on. And were you yeah. the beneficiaries of someone else b uh, digging the foxholes? Oh, yes. So well, in this particular case, when we were sitting in the Siegfried line, I hope I'm not making this too disjointed for not you. Not at all. No. Um, uh, sitting in the Siegfried line, uh, uh, these bunkers had already been uh, built, uh, covered over with uh, with wood, and then boughs on top of that, and, a, and an entrance. And it may even have been uh, the Germans who who had built them originally, but we were the recipients of their uh, uh, of, of their labor. Yeah. When you talk about the Siegfried line, mm -hmm. will you mm. explain that a little? Sure. It was a uh, it was a line uh, in um, in Germany to uh, to keep out invaders. Uh, they um, they thought uh, you know they thought that they could uh, they, well they just thought that they could build these series of bunkers and whatnot and put uh, uh, put armament in there uh, and put machine guns and all that sort of stuff and keep any invaders from from coming in. But uh, but they were they, they were eventually you know rousted out and yeah. During and this time period, were you in any way or was your unit in any way affiliated with General Patton's troops? No, no. We were in the Ninth Army, uh, and that was commanded by a man by the name of Luther Hodges. And Patton was to the south. He was he had the Third Army, and he was to the south of us. 
And were you able to hear about what was going on in other areas yeah, of the war? Yeah, a little war? bit. Yes, a, a little bit. And uh, now, whether or not it was through the Stars and Stripes, which was a an army publication, or word of mouth, or whatever, I I honestly don't know. Yeah, um, I think. Gee, I think also, if I recall, I think I got an issue of Time magazine sent to me. Uh, you know, a small military edition, and and that would give somewhat of a recap too. Uh, but it, uh, you know, it caught up with us periodically, uh, and I and I don't recall much other than one or two uh, instances. Uh, I know I wrote home to my family and told them that we had been mentioned in Time magazine, and gave them the date. You know. And what did they say in the they article? Said, they, they said that it was a, 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 gr a green, uh, inexperienced unit committed to battle uh, on the 2nd or 3rd or whatever it was of February, yeah, and uh, the 69th Division, yeah, so, yeah. And, we, and that was an apt description because we were, sure. <laughs> really, yeah. Yeah. What do you think some of your greatest challenges were while you were in direct combat? Oh, I, uh, I, you know, I think just uh, making sure that everybody was okay, you know, making sure that you were okay, trying to stay clean and warm, uh, and uh, you know, and and do whatever you had to do to survive, really. Were you able to make close friends in this period of time? Yeah, I did. Uh, a couple of people, um, uh, a fellow who was our squad leader was from Dorchester. Do you know his name? Yeah, Bill Burke. Yeah. And he later became a Boston policeman and he was a he was a, he was really he was a good soldier. Did Excellent you keep soldier. in touch with him after the war? I did for a while and then uh, with uh, you know with family and he he got married and and, uh, and started a family and then his uh, uh, you know his his job I was his duties may have just, uh, and we just kind of drifted apart. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another fellow was a young man by the name of Herman Wilde, and uh, one of the really nice young men that I, I met in the service, and he, he was an excellent athlete, and I told him that I really wanted to see him at Notre Dame, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I kept uh, I kept up uh, uh, you know contact with him for some little time, uh, and eventually we too drifted apart. As, did he go uh, to Notre Dame? No, I don't think he ever did. I don't know where he went really. And a fellow from Georgia by the name of Red Windham, he was our uh, truck driver, and uh, I, I was in contact with him for a few years after uh, after the war. Once you got through the Siegfried Line, March of 1945, mm, mm -hmm. war was coming to an end. Yeah. Did you yeah. know that? Yeah, we could uh, we could sense it, and I think that they, uh, I think that we were given to understand that we had, you know, that we had the Germans on the run, but that there were still pockets of resistance, and particularly among the uh, the SS troops. That they were, you know, they were. This was Hitler's elite, you know. Did you they, run into any of them? We did. This is the unit that had. Uh, this is the unit that had had us pinned down, in um, in April. Yeah, they they were not they were not going to go away quietly, really. And uh, but those are the, that was the only time that we ran into them, and uh, uh, some some of you know some of the other units ran into them, and you know in in, in serious. Uh, uh, like house to house uh, fighting in in certain villages, and we didn't we didn't get involved in that. Our mission, as the, as an anti tank gun crew attached to a headquarters company, was to protect the uh, the headquarters and the command post, uh, and that's uh, that's mainly what uh, that's mainly what our mission was. After Germany, mm -hmm. did you then go back? The way you would come through Belgium, through France. No, we went. Um, uh, our unit, uh, our division, was the one who met the Russians on the Elbe River in 1945. Yeah, <clears throat> it was the 69th Division, and uh, 
not our regiment, but another uh, another regiment uh, met the Russians, and um, and then from there uh, it was it was back to old like several different locations. They deployed the division back to several locations, and and some of us. Uh, and I don't recall all of the uh, all of the logistics of this, but um, some of the uh, some of the people were split up and sent to other units that were in residence in that in that particular area, and uh, I uh, I was one of the ones who was transferred out. Um, I went then to a, a unit called the 29th Division which had been seen a tremendous amount of uh, this is after the end of the at the end of the war yeah which uh, and they had seen a tremendous amount of action beginning with the invasion um, and uh, while I was there I, I uh, started a uh, what they call an information and education program under the direction of a lieutenant uh, <clears throat> and started teaching French to, uh, and, and this is what they were doing. Uh, they were offering different programs in order to keep, you know, the, uh, the soldiers happy while they were w awaiting rotation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and keep them interested and keep them out of trouble. Um, and uh, it didn't always work, but <laughs> it was a good effort. Sure. Yeah. And um, from, from that, um, and I, I don't recall uh, the name of the town or anything else, but it was in central Germany uh, and uh, probably more toward the south, but I, 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 can't be, I can't be certain. So did you finish your war efforts in that particular area? Yeah, we, we uh, in, uh, uh, right at the, at the, at the battle, at, at the uh, meeting at the Elbe River, that was it. That was just that about was the, the end. end. Yeah, that was the end, really. Yeah. And then, how long yeah. were you in central or south central Germany teaching I, French? I was there for about uh, four months. Uh, yeah, four months, just about. Um, and uh, in September, uh, the government again <laughs> graciously started another program uh, to, uh, to to help uh, those who were, of us who had been to college. And it intended to go back uh, to uh, hone our skills somewhat, and they used existing universities that were still standing in Europe uh, uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, to get us uh, to get us back into the swing of things uh, uh, scholastically, uh, <clears throat> and uh, where they didn't have uh, a university existing. They made one up. Uh, for example, I went to uh, what they termed the American University at Biarritz, which is on the Bis Bay of Biscay, just north of the Spanish border. And they commandeered or took over hotels and villas, and we had our cl we had classes in the villas and the hotels, and we lived in hotels. And the food was excellent, and the, we had three we had three rules. We, we we had to wear our uniforms, we had to go to classes, and we had to observe military bearing at all times. Those were the three rules that the general who was commanding this unit uh, laid down for us, and the, and we had professors there from Boston University, from Princeton, from uh, Wheaton College, from all over. Really, were yeah. these professors flown over, or were they also in no, the no, war? No, no, they, they were flown over. They mm -hmm. were part, they were part of this um, information and education program that the army had started. Uh, so, how long were you in college? In college, in, this, <laughs> in Europe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm. I was there from uh, September um, until. It may have been late September until right just after the first of the year in 1946, and uh, had Thanksgiving there and Christmas there and whatnot. And, uh, and one of the things that we had access to was a golf course. And of course I loved, 
still do love to play golf, and uh, and I got friendly with a uh, French professional golfer, and uh, and we would play uh, probably four times a week, and I would go to the golf course every day after class, and uh, go up there and hit golf balls and play golf and whatnot, and it was I mean it was where the idle rich of Europe used to spend their time, you know, when they weren't making money or making war, <laughs> really. It was a, oh God, it was a marvelous spot, really. So it was a yeah. nice way to end oh, yeah. what originally oh, was a tough situation. Yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent way, really. So then yeah. in January, or approximately January 46, were yeah, you then? I was transferred then to yet another place, and it wasn't a particular, I don't recall it as being a, uh, a unit as such, um, you know, like the 69th Division or whatever. I don't remember the name of it, to be honest with you, but uh, it was in Bremerhaven, Germany, uh, and, uh, and, and it was called the Marine Barracks. And uh, I, I went up there, and, and, the, and it, we basically we pulled guard duty uh, on the ships coming into Bremerhaven, uh, you know, unloading supplies for uh, for the American troops, and whether or not there was an, I know I don't, I'm certain that there was no lend lease or no Marshall Plan or anything of that nature. Whether there any of this found its way into the rehabilitation of the German population, I don't know, but uh, but it was I think it was mainly uh, for the uh, resupply. Of the uh, of the U.S. troops who were still in Europe, and Bremerhaven was one of the ports that was uh, the least damaged, and uh, and and certainly a big port, and uh, you know could ca take care of the American ships, and and our basic duty was guard duty on uh, on these uh, on these ships. And so, then when you were off duty, what would you yeah. do? Uh, there wasn't there wasn't a great deal to do really. Um, there was. Um, no, there, there really wasn't. There wasn't a great deal to do. I mean, you could go to the beer hall. Uh, there wasn't. There wasn't a great deal of recreational uh, uh, activity going on. It was win It was winter time, uh, and while there wasn't uh, much, if any, snow up there that I recall, uh, you certainly couldn't go out and throw a football around or play baseball mm -hmm. or anything of that nature. Yeah. So, what do you feel were some of your most memorable experiences or memorable character that you you might remember? I think <laughs> I think that train ride was one thing that I would remember. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think uh, and and that school, uh, you know, having had the opportunity to meet. Uh, this uh, this French professional golfer. Do you remember uh, his name? Albert Doge. Albert Doge. Yeah, and he had a wife and uh, three children, and uh, and then some of his compatriots too, uh, and I don't remember their names, but they were all very pleasant, uh, and uh, and then there were there were of course there were other uh, soldiers like myself who were able to take advantage of this facility too and we had uh, I mean we had a marvelous time up there I didn't associate exclusively with him uh, but uh, I, I took um, I was able to take two two of his children to our Christmas party uh, at, at this hotel where we were living and put on by the, the GIs and the distribution of gifts and whatnot and they they really enjoyed that was it also a time when you could really um, hone in on your French language? Oh, Was yes. that helpful to you? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And mm. were you able to stay in contact with Mr. Droger after the war? No, I had I had thought that I would like to, uh, and I would love to have been able to go back, uh, you know. But I uh, never had the money, <laughs> nor the time, or whatever, in order to be able to do it right, uh, you know. So I I just. Uh, we just kind of drifted apart, really, yeah. And when were you discharged from the service? Yeah, in March of 1946. From where? From Fort Devens. So did yeah. you take a uh, ship back? 
We did. We came home, oh my God, we came home across the North Atlantic in March, which is the stormiest time of the year, on the Central Falls Victory. I'll never forget it. <laughs> I don't know how many troops there were on that ship. It's not a very big ship, but I was as sick as a dog. Oh, it was up and down and up and down and oh, it was unbelievable. And it took us 14 days. Yeah. And did you come uh, into New York or California? No, we did. We came into New York. New York. Yeah. What yeah. do you remember what it was like feeling oh, coming home yeah. or coming oh, into yes. the yeah. harbor? Uh, yeah, it, it was an absolutely, uh, you know, magnificent feeling because I, I, can, I can still see uh, it was daylight and, uh, and I was standing at the rail with a, with a fellow whom I had met and I wish that I could remember his name now but I can't, uh, a nice young man from, uh, from New York um, and as we passed the Statue of Liberty, it was, uh, it was really, it was very moving, yeah. Really? Emotional for yes, you? Yes, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you sense yeah. that's the way a lot of your um, oh, buddies I would, were feeling? Yeah, I would think so. I would think that that, yeah, that, that, uh, and I think that that probably has been depicted in various and sundry publications, uh, uh, you know, over the, over the years, and it certainly, it, it, I can, I can identify with that, really, yeah. What was it like coming back to Natick and back to your family? Yeah, it uh, it was a wonderful feeling, was really. It? Yeah, to be able to come back and be greeted, you know, be greeted by uh, you know the townspeople and my family and whatnot, and and renew old acquaintances and yeah. So it was, uh, and the, and the reception, uh, you know, the reception was wonderful, really. Uh, and then uh, trying to get back to school and you know. And did you get try. back to school? I went back to BU, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and did you uh, graduate yeah. from BU? No, I didn't. Uh, no, I, uh, I, got, uh, I got a job. Uh, I went into, uh, into the wool business um, and uh, I went to BU nights and, uh, and then uh, after, a, after a few years I, um, I, I had a great interest in the trucking industry, and I was still going to school, still going to, uh, to BU Knights, uh, but I, I really got involved in and interested in the trucking industry, and I went to, I dropped out of BU and went to a school called the Traffic Managers Institute, uh, and that is, uh, that's a New York-based outfit with schools satellite schools throughout the country and I and I, I did uh, co uh, complete their two-year course and then spent several years in the trucking industry. Mm. When you came home you were single mm -hmm. and mm. how long after that did you get married? In uh, August of 1947. And was it a local girl? Uh, Jean McCarty, yep, yep. Uh, just as an aside, yeah. Jean's family just had a display here on World War I oh, they did, from her father yeah. mm -hmm. who served in France. That's right. And yeah. it was quite mm -hmm. an interesting display. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So yeah. you were in the trucking industry for how long? Mm, probably 12 years, yeah. And then from there, what did you do? Okay, then um, I did run into. Uh, some so-called health problems, um, alcoholism, really, uh, and... Uh, Do you feel that that may have been caused by some of the experiences you had in the war? No, I don't think so, mm -hmm. really, no, I, I, I don't think so. I think, uh, uh, I don't know what caused it, really, mm -hmm. yeah, I, uh, it is no, uh, I haven't been able to come up with, nor do I think a great deal about the, the causes of it, really, mm -hmm. at, at the present time. I just, all I know is that, uh, you know, there has been a way out, and, uh, That's good. yeah. Mm. How important do you feel it was for you to serve in the military, and how it may have affected your life? Yeah. I, th I think it enriched my life, yeah, most assuredly, and, 
and opened up, uh, you know, uh, opened up a whole bunch of horizons to um, a kid from a rural community. Well, Natick was a rural, rural community back then, or a small, really a small community, and this certainly was, you know, you, you were exposed to the ideas of people, say like from Dorchester, New York City, uh, Philadelphia, the West Coast, uh, uh, Hispanics and black people that we just didn't have an opportunity to to uh, to get to know here in Natick, in, in Natick mm -hmm. really, yeah. Um, so that it was a wonderful opportunity and a great learning experience, really. And uh, the nicest part, of course, was being able to survive. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was extremely important, I think, yeah. And, and plus the fact that may, if in some small way making a contribution to your country and your fellow man, really. One of the questions that we ask other veterans in this interviewing process mm -hmm. is how you individually feel about the difference of public opinion regarding yeah. the veterans of your generation versus the vet veterans of the Korean conflict and those of the Vietnam era. Mm. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, and, and unfortunately, <coughs> um, I, well, I, I should say fortunately, <coughs> I don't believe that the uh, Korean veterans were subjected to the same disrespect that the Vietnam people were, uh, the, the veterans of the, of the Vietnam conflict. Uh, and, and, uh, and, I, and I'm glad about that. Uh, I'm just sorry that the, that the people who served so valiantly in the Vietnam conflict were not well received at home. You know, Why that, do you think that was? I think that I think it was just a time of uh, deceit in government, uh, and I think that uh, I just I just think that maybe our leaders were less than candid and honest with us, uh, and that people just resented that. And so those who participated uh, bore the brunt of that. Uh, that that's just uh, that's how I perceive it, anyway. But I had um, uh, at the time that my two sons, the two older boys, were going into the service. I had a very dear friend who, one of my professors at Georgetown, as a matter of fact, with whom I was in contact up until the time that he died. Uh, and he he said, "Be sure." <coughs> And <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, and tell Jim and Dan that uh, patriotism is also a virtue, mm. as well as courage and whatnot. So, well yeah. spoken. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything mm. you would like to leave us with this afternoon? Something, a thought, or a memory that you'd like to share, not only with your family, excuse me, but with community <coughs> members or those from future generations who may be viewing this tape for research or simply for enjoyment purposes or to get a better understanding of what it was like for you? Uh, and I thought a little bit about that and there are two things. Um, there's a, uh, and I looked for it today and I couldn't find it, um, a um, oh, small essay, if you will, called The Desiderata are you familiar with it? I'm not. Okay, it, um, okay it, it's a re if I find this print, I will send it to you, okay? And uh, it was found in Old St. Paul's Cathedral in Baltimore when they were doing some renovation work. I don't know who wrote it, but um, at the end, uh, it, said, uh, it said something about, despite all the trickery uh, and other things that may be in the world today, it's still a beautiful place, so enjoy it. And <clears throat> and I, uh, I I kind of I kind of like that. I like that. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And and the other thing that um, I don't I don't want to get <laughs> religious, but um, but um, uh, Christ said to his disciples, love one another, and uh, and that's what I feel. Uh, Something to think about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We yeah. want to thank you, Frank Foley, for sharing some of your memories, mm -hmm. past and present, with us mm -hmm. today. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it, really. It was I'm wonderful. Glad. Good. Thank you.